Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. Afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to just give it a few more seconds. We've already got um, a fair few people joined in, which is fantastic. But we'll just give them a few more seconds for some more to join us before we start. But um, warm welcome to you on a beautiful but chilly day. Just like to add my hello on this bright and chilly day. I'm glad to hear that so many people are with us this afternoon. Right, I think we've got a lovely number here now. So um, let's get started. Um, right, afternoon, everybody. Afternoon, Liz. Nice to see you in the chat already. That's brilliant using the chat so quickly on. Really? Really sorry we can't see everybody in person, um, but fantastic to have you join us this way. Um, it's a big change for us through this past year, but being able to do this is, is an amazing thing, actually. I would like it even more if we're in the same room, but great to see you. My name is Kath Mummery, and I'm a consultant at the Dementia Research Centre at Queen's Square, and I'm the clinical lead for this group. This is very much a team effort, and you'll see on the screen as well, um, Nikki Zimmerman, who's our support lead, and my co-chair, Jackie, who leads member support. And I'll, um, you'll be seeing more of them later as they're going to give a couple of the talks that we'll have. On the team is also Alicia, who's our fantastic coordinator, and Seb Crutch, who's the director of the Red Dementia Support. We're also gonna have some input from patients and carers um, later with John and Pippa, very kindly agreeing to talk to us. So this group is something we've been discussing for over two years now, I think it is, Nikki. And it's fantastic to finally have our very first group, in spite of all the difficulties we've had in the past year. As a number of you will know, and as Nikki is going to talk to you later, um, the Rare Dementia Support Network has grown over the years in its reach and in the number of different rare diseases that we support. And it's become increasingly apparent that young onset Alzheimer's disease, the group that's actually fallen through the gaps in some ways, um, that didn't really have the support that these people and, and their families needed, and hence the development of this group. So we're passionate about making a real difference. And I really hope that together with you, we can improve support for our patients and their carers and enhance education and understanding of the challenges of living with young onset Alzheimer's disease. So we have a very full and varied agenda for today's meeting. Um, the first half of the session, we're gonna have a series of brief talks which give a number of different perspectives on rare dementia support and on young onset Alzheimer's disease. And then the second half of the session, we will dedicate to a Q&A session, um, which is chaired by Seb Crutch, and it should give plenty of time for anybody who wants to join the conversation to um, raise any queries they have or follow up on things that have, have been spoken about in the talks. We've got quite a mixed group um, joining us today and, and a really nice number of people, which is fantastic. So I'm hoping the conversation is going to be lively. During the talks, if you have any questions, please do put them down in the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom webinar, and then we'll do our best to answer them. Nikki's shaking her head at me, which means something, I think. No, please don't <laughs> put them in the chat box button, put them in the Q&A button. Um, all the people out there today will have two buttons that they can use, the Q&A, which is for the questions, and they will come straight through to uh, us. So we'll be filtering them. Claire's in the background today, filtering them through to Seb. You can use the chat button, please do. We probably won't be able to answer the chats with the comments and things, but it's lovely to hear from you. But the Q&A is for the questions, please. That is a perfect demonstration of why we have Nikki. So there you go. <laughs> so Nikki is the one that keeps us in order. And as a result, is about to give you the housekeeping rules because I would be hopeless at that. So Nikki, I'm gonna hand over to you. Beautiful segue. <laughs> Thank you, Kath. And really, we've not got a huge amount of housekeeping uh, rules. Just to let you know that uh, the only people you will see today is the, us and the panellists. So your cameras will be permanently off and your mics will be permanently off. So you won't be able to see or hear anybody else. So it's lovely that some of you have already put in the chat box who you are, because it, re it really makes it special for us. Um, I've just explained the Q&A, so that's great. We will try and endeavour to answer all your questions today 
If, however, a question comes through that is really quite complex and really quite personal and does need a lot of sort of interaction and one-to-one -one support, we will take that back and we'll be answering that sort of with the support team because it might need that you might need a actual support call for this. So we're more than happy to do that. So if your question isn't answered, there probably be, will be a reason why for it. And if we do get lots and lots of questions today and we run out of time, please don't worry because we will be behind the scenes writing these questions up and we will be forward, forwarding these next week to you. As you know, this is recorded. So the recording will be going uh, live on our website next week and we will send you the links for that. And we hope that you will share them with as many people as possible because it'd be lovely to get the word out there. Um, it is our new group and as many of you may have noticed, there isn't anything on our website at the moment. Um, this will, this will be rectified. We wanted to have a nice sort of slow sort of start for this and not be completely overwhelmed and inundated, but be able to provide the correct support for you. So um, slowly we will be getting more things onto our website and hopefully it'll build up like our other properties as well. Um, and I think that's all I really need to say to, to you, apart from sit, we, you know, hopefully you'll sit back and enjoy and send us lots of questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That's really helpful. Um, and without further ado, let's get on to the agenda. So our first talk is from the fabulous Nikki. Um, as you can see, not only does she keep us in order, but she's also a total powerhouse, especially apparently after she's had her second vaccination, she tells me. <laughs> so she's also our direct support lead um, for the RDS services. And since she's joined, and I'm not, not going to spare her blushes, she's transformed the coordination and delivery of, of that part of our support. Fantastic direct support team for our patients and carers. And it's been absolutely transformational during the past year which has been such a difficult time for so many people. Um, so helping those isolated and affected, you've done an amazing job, Nikki. She's going to outline for us what the RDS services are and our principles and objectives. Thank you very much, Nikki. Good afternoon. It's fantastic to be here um, with you all this afternoon. I'm delighted to be launching the Young Onset Alzheimer's Disease Support Group. Um, I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about what rare dementia support actually does today and we're going to have a look at some slides to help illustrate this. So rare dementia support, we had our very first support group in 1994. I wasn't there, I'd hasten to add that. Um, but the very first support group was the FTD support group for carers of people living with frontotemporal dementia. And over the year, we have grown immensely. Um, the YOAD, the Young Onset Alzheimer's Disease Support Group, is our seventh group. And we now have about 2,400 members that we look after. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, but yo onset Alzheimer's disease is very different as you will very much know yourselves. It brings about a unique set of challenges and there's a real lack in age appropriate support that's available out there. We want to really help with that. We know local support is really important and we want to be able to provide some national support which will help feed into that as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do at Rare Dementia Support. So Rare Dementia Support, we provide one-to-one -one support. Uh, we have national diagnosis specific support group meetings and support which goes along with those meetings as well. We have developed some small discussion groups which we started last year and we also have about 30 regional support group meetings which are available all through the country and we've now started going international with those as well. So here is the direct support team. Um, I'm the lead, I'm Nikki Zimmerman. I'm very passionate about young onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, my father had this several years ago and this is really where it sparked sort of my career into looking after people with dementia and especially now rare dementias. Um, I've worked over the years in various different settings and I'm delighted that now at Rare Dementia Support we're going to be focusing on this. Um, working along, we have the lovely Claire at the top with the lovely blonde hair. We have Livy next to her with the dark hair here. And then along the bottom, we have Trish, who's our rights and entitlements officer. We have 
Hannah, who's the Admiral nurse, and then there's lovely Alicia and Sam on the end here. So we've got a fantastic team full of wonderful skill sets and here to look after and to support people and advise um, and help as many people as we can. So what do we do at the direct support team? Well, we're here to listen, we're empathetic, and we hope we're empowering, providing one-to-one -one support by either email, phone or video call. Uh, we know that people are still working, so people may prefer just to email us. It's lovely when we do get to talk to them on the phone and video calls, we can provide that service if people want that, especially when they want more of their family involved with this. Um, our support, we can support sort of nationally and locally, as I said, with signposting to relevant services. And included in our services, we've got a legal advice service, which can provide a one hour free advice service for people that are dealing with some legal matters. We also encourage work in the community, so buddying and our RDS community. So we encourage informal links between individual RDS members to, to meet others, probably online as it is at the moment, um, to provide peer support and share experiences, good or bad with them. So the support that we provide, it really starts with a diagnosis navigation for a lot of people. As you know, it's not easy to get a specific diagnosis, um, especially with support. So we, we can help with people if they've got problems or worries, where to navigate them to the specific services to get an accurate diagnosis. And with that, it becomes the need for post-diagnosis education afterwards so to make sure that people understand what their diagnosis is and what the impact this is going to have and this impact is not just for the person with the diagnosis it's on the family as well and for everybody to have an understanding with this which is really helpful moving forward we we then help look at sort of coping strategies how to live well as possible as much as possible and sort of coping strategies within the family if there's any issues going on looking for triggers and how to deal deal with issues we know that um a lot of help is going to be needed throughout that journey. It's not a journey that people would want to go on, but if we can actually help them to navigate them through the maze of what is the health and social care system, which is often very interchangeable and uh, certainly um, it differs from uh, in variation from area to area, we can help with that. Like I said, we've got Trish with us, who's our rights and entitlements officer, and really she's there to sort of give you advice what your rights are, um, especially when dealing with external partners. It's really important that care planning and especially sort of advanced care planning is something that sort of we all look at and we can help people with that to make their say the choices that they want to make sure that their wishes are granted as well. Um, and this is much better to be done at an early stage rather than later stages. We're there to support people at different stages and really not forgetting about complex issues and in the later stages. We never discharge people from our service. We not, might not be there constantly every day helping people, but we are a point of contact for people to get in contact with us. So the large groups that we do, as I said, we've been running for many years now, and we've got national diagnosis specific support group meetings that we have. Some are the quarterly, some are annually, and some happen twice a year. And these are for the rarer types of dementia. Um, they're all abbreviations. We use abbreviations, acronyms for everything. So PCA, that's the posterior cortical atrophy group. PPA, primary progressive aphasia group, FTD, frontotemporal dementia, LBD, Lewy bodies dementia, and then we've got the two genetic associated groups, familiar FTD and familiar Alzheimer's disease. We also have a mixed carers group, and we split that now into early and mid stages and mid to late stages, so we can deal with different stages and different topics which are relevant in those stages. Well, pre-COVID, we had a lovely venue at the Welcome Centre in Euston where we would meet for our meetings. And I said they would vary whether they would be sort of quarterly or annually. Um, it was a fantastic venue. We could have a good few hours there. People could come for coffee to start the meetings. We'd have a range of speakers coming and we'd enjoy lunch together, meeting other people from all over the country who came down especially for the day. And we'd be able to sort of have small group discussions so people can meet people face to face with those in similar situations. 
Obviously, COVID came along last year and we've changed over to webinars. So it's all very much like we're doing today. Uh, post COVID, we are very much looking forward to that. We do realize that we, we have advantages in both of them. And one of the things that the webinars has brought out as we can reach out to people in geographic locations that can't travel to London. We have many members, as I said, um, which are in different parts of the world, in Canada, in America, in Australia, which really wouldn't be able to travel to London, but they've been able to join our meetings. Uh, we've also realised that people with intensive caring duties couldn't come as well. So the webinars have been proved good for them. So going forward, post COVID, we'll be doing a blended service. And we also have the bereaved groups, which are smaller groups. They are national. Um, uh, as I said before, we don't discharge people. So we do have some bereaved carers groups available as well. Um, last year, when we went into COVID, we started doing some small group discussions. So this was through video call, inviting up to 12 members to come and share their experience. Sometimes it was very information based and sometimes it was just to meet other people and share experience. And these were based on various different topics to meet the needs of people at different stages. We've come, continued these throughout sort of the year at different stages and we'll be continuing these going forward as well in various different sort of formats also. And as I said, we've got regional groups. We've got up to about 30 groups at the moment. And these are set in different parts of the country. We started these when we could see gaps in parts of the country was not much support was going on in the ground. And some of these groups are specific for PCA or for PPA, for example, but some can be a mixture of groups uh, as long as it's rare dementia, people are welcome to join these groups. And people come to these groups to share experiences with each other and gain um, peer support. They're often run by health professionals or by people who've had personal experience and are either caring for someone with a rare dementia or has done so in the past. Um, as I said, it, everything's online at the moment, so this is the way it's running. But before this happened, they would run in various different sort of settings, sometimes health centre um, with a, a health professional facilitating them. Sometimes they were cafes or garden centres, anything like that, which was suitable. So, as I said, this is the new YOAD support group and we want to support people. Um, so if you're watching today and you are living with young onset Alzheimer's disease or caring with someone, or if you're a health professional, please encourage people to sign up to become a member or to send us an email and we'd love to be in contact with you. I'll be on the panel later today, so please send some questions in for me. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That was a fantastic summary of a huge amount of work in a very short time. Um, it's such an immense range of intervention from one to one to national and the fact that it's individualized so well according to need and, and is, is amazing. So thank you very much for that summary. Um, I'm going to move on to our next talk, which is from Jackie. Um, and Jackie is co-chair of this group and has personal experience of caring for someone with young onset Alzheimer's disease. So as well as knowing all too well the value and the need for appropriate support in this group, she's also been an educator all her life and has raised awareness for URAD for many years, giving talks in a variety of settings. So her support and expertise is invaluable in our team. She's going to outline the rationale for this group, why it's so badly needed. Thank you very much, Jackie. I'm delighted to be here at the launch of this new group. While we've been living through the pandemic, I've thought a lot about the people living with dementia in times of COVID, and especially those in the early stages of Alzheimer's or looking for a diagnosis. And I'm delighted that the planning for this launch has continued in spite of everything. It feels like a real milestone today. As you know, the Rare Dementia Service at UCL already works in six identified forms of rare dementia. There's PCA and PPA and FTD and FFTD and FA and LBD. And now we can add YOAD as the magnificent seventh acronym. And my role is to say a little bit about the need for this new group and some of the aspects of the condition that might be the basis for the work going forward. Evidently, my perspective is not that of clinician, 
but as a family carer. I was the main carer for my husband, Tony, from his diagnosis in 2010 at the age of 60, although in retrospect, it had affected him for several years prior to that. So in the spirit of the Magnificent Seven, I'd like to offer seven reasons why such a group might be helpful and some of the themes that we might develop going forward. The, the first one is, is the theme of rarity itself. I think ONS data says that there are 850,000 people living with dementia in the UK, but only around 42,000 of those are under the age of 65, and around 20,000 of those have young onset Alzheimer's disease. So while Alzheimer's is certainly common relatively, the plain vanilla of the dementia illnesses, if you like, young onset is definitely not. And for us, that rarity led to a tremendous sense of isolation. Young onset breaks all the stereotypes. We already knew quite a lot about dementia because Tony's adoptive mother had vascular dementia and we cared for her while she lived in a care home nearby. But now we felt that we were the only people that this had ever happened to at this age. I can remember Tony saying that he felt like an absolute freak. Things have improved over time, I believe, over the decade that we lived through it. But that point of diagnosis is indeed a crucial time. And that brings me to my second point, which is diagnosis. It took over four years in our case to get to that point. Young onset Alzheimer's often presents a general cognitive decline, and it can be mistaken for depression or for work-related stress. Some of the other rare dementias have very specific markers, such as changes to speech patterns or visual perception that make them more readily identifiable. In my opinion, also, and experience, there's too much emphasis on memory. Memory was the least of Tony's problems at that point. For that reason, the road to diagnosis can be a very long one. And the manner of the diagnosis makes an enormous difference to the well-being of all going forward. Thinking about well-being of all going brings me to my third point, which is the impact on family. A diagnosis of young onset Alzheimer's has a massive impact on family and on family life. One of the things that sometimes made me angry as we went through our experience was that point when people say to you very well meaningly, I know just what you're going through, my granddad or my great auntie or whatever had Alzheimer's, well, forgive me, you actually have no idea what I'm going through. I'm not denying for a moment those problems, but caring for your partner with dementia is not at all the same. And the impact of an Alzheimer's diagnosis on younger families where children may be in their 20s and teens or even younger, living with Alzheimer's has all sorts of ramifications, which are very unusual. One of those things might be giving up work at short notice. I know that not everybody does, but certainly that was the case for both Tony and myself. And so in the middle of all this confusion, you start to look around for help. And that brings me to my number four. Number four is services. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not at all disparaging of some of the wonderful work that is being done out there. But because Alzheimer's is seen very largely as a disease of old age, services are typically not designed for young people. And, and fair enough, that's largely because there's not the critical mass to make them viable in many cases. Alongside that, perhaps, was our own reluctance to engage. Tony wanted to be traveling, he wanted to be going to gigs, he wanted to be going to the theater. So tea and cake at the Alzheimer's Cafe was a club that he just didn't want to be in. We did try, but over time, we discovered that what was most helpful was establishing links with others in the same boat and developing our own knowledge base and support network. And this group could be a big support in that respect. Working within a group of people who are sharing the same experiences brings me to my fifth point, which is about progress and the stages of the disease. And I know that work on staging is going on in the context of some of the other RDS groups. Uh, you know, again, as I said, I'm not a clinician, but over 10 years, and indeed before that, I've spent a lot of time with people of all ages with dementia. And I believe that the progress of Alzheimer's in young people seems to be very different from that in older age groups. 
just an example, we went to a day centre for a while and there were people there in their late 80s who'd been living with Alzheimer's for, for years. who were still doing crosswords and Sudoku's at a time when Tony could no longer read. And there are also some quite unhelpful stereotypes of the condition. For example, there's a frequent metaphor of a bookshelf being emptied shelf by shelf, which accounts for that idea of people with Alzheimer's living in the past and constantly referring to childhood memories. That never happened in Tony's case. The past and the future very rapidly disappeared into a fog of Alzheimer's quite rapidly until Tony lived entirely in the present moment, which at times is actually not a bad place to be. Maybe I've run the risk of focusing on the negative. And there's a couple of points, my sixth and seventh, which pick on that. First off, people with young onset are much less likely to have comorbidities and in spite of Alzheimer's can continue to learn new things. The brain is plastic and a mind affected by Alzheimer's can achieve surprising things. People with young onset Alzheimer's are likely to be otherwise fit. They can, active, they can be active, they can engage in physical activity, travel continues to be possible and new learning takes place. Tony, in the early years of his Alzheimer's, cycled from coast to coast, raised a lot of money for Alzheimer's research. He reinvented himself as an artist, and if you've been struck by this painting on the wall behind me, um, that was Tony's work. Um, and he was somebody who had never, ever so much as doodled um, before he became affected by Alzheimer's. We travelled a lot, as long as Tony continued to enjoy it. Whatever he wanted to do, it was why not, rather than you can't. I think that could be an important theme for this group. And finally, my number seven, which is simply this, that being in a group keeps you in the loop. And finding people are on the same journey, albeit one that none of us actually wanted to take, can offer immense support through information sharing, through practical advice, and through help with the experience of practicalities of day-to-day -day living. And that can be a big emotional help and can contribute to well-being for all concerned. The RDS offers an additional dimension in that it is run by and with clinicians and researchers working alongside with those with the diagnosis and their carers. One of the things that made a big difference for Tony and for me was that we felt it was really important to engage in research and to do whatever we could to help toward a better understanding of support and of treatments and one day, maybe even a cure for Alzheimer's. So I'm really looking forward to working with you all on this as we go forward in the future. Jackie, thank you. That was a beautiful and eloquent description of the challenges with young onset Alzheimer's disease from a lived perspective. It really brings home what we need to do, and it brings to life the issues that people like me, the clinicians, are aware of, but we can't understand the reality of them unless we've actually lived through them like you and we share those experiences and learn from you. And you brought us back to some of the positives that we mustn't forget, that we, we must grasp and make the most of. It's so important. So thank you for a fantastic talk. I'm going to hand over to Nikki next, um, and that's the last you'll see of me for a little while. Thank you, Kath. Well, I'm just going to introduce Kath, actually, for our next slot. And Kath's going to give us a clinical overview of young onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, Kath is a cognitive neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. And that's where she's the clinical lead as well. She is extremely passionate about her role. And more so, she's extremely passionate about looking after her patients and families there. I've been very privileged to work with Kath over the last few years um, and to help support many of those patients. And it was, it's been great that me and Kath have actually been able to speak for the last few years of actually forming this group. So I'm absolutely delighted that you know, we've, we've come to this today. And I hope you're realizing out there that there is a great theme going along with the girl power that's happening with the leads here today. So this is just absolutely fantastic. So I will leave you now with Kath. Thank you.
Hello everyone, it's a real privilege to be a part of this very first meeting for Young Onset Alzheimer's Disease. This has been a long time coming, so I'm really excited to have you all here. I was asked to give a brief clinical overview of Young Onset Alzheimer's Disease. Many of you will be familiar with what I, I am talking about, um, but I hope this is a useful introduction into our further conversations. So in fact, um, Alzheimer's disease was originally thought of as young onset. The very first case had symptom onset, this is August Dieter in the picture, in her 40s. But then for the next 50 years, after first defining it as young onset, it started to be thought of as a disease of old age, as a pre-senile dementia. And unfortunately, that momentum was then lost until relatively recently. So how do we define young onset Alzheimer's disease? The definition is clinical onset of symptoms before the age of 65. But that's an arbitrary cutoff. As we know, Alzheimer's disease is a continuum across the ages. And there's no magic switch between 64 and 65. But it is useful in, in some respects to think of it in this way. So young onset Alzheimer's disease involves the same pathology as late onset Alzheimer's disease in both we have plaques and tangles causing the disease and cell damage. That's amyloid protein and tau protein together with inflammation causing the damage to the brain. But there are significant differences in the presentation and in the impact. And it's really important that we keep those in mind when working out how best to help and support from the clinical practical point of view. Young onset Alzheimer's disease is, as, as you will all know, a tremendous burden for individuals, for their families, as well as at societal levels. It is not rare. Young onset Alzheimer's disease accounts for five to 7% of all Alzheimer's disease. That's about 40,000 cases just in the UK. And the incidence increases as age approaches 65. Alzheimer's disease is the commonest cause of young onset dementia. It accounts for a third to a half of all cases. So it is really important that we learn how to manage it and support correctly. An important difference between late onset and, and young onset is that so-called atypical presentations are more common. And this means presentations, symptoms that are not led with memory. So a third of individuals with young onset Alzheimer's disease have a non-memory presentation. It's only 6% in late onset. And that might involve visual symptoms, spatial navigation symptoms, difficulty with motor coordination, with language, or even behavioral symptoms. And as you can see, they are much more common in those under 65 and under 60 than those over but memory is still the most common presentation, so we mustn't forget it. Importantly, depression, seen in brown here within the ring, is much more common when individuals are younger than older. And that's so important in how we look after people when they present. So going into a little more detail in the sorts of ways that young onset Alzheimer's disease might present. It's important to remember that with all of these different presentations, they may well overlap. And one individual may have symptoms from several different groups. In addition, as the disease progresses, these presentations tend to merge. But there's still a useful way of, of thinking about how to recognize people with young onset Alzheimer's disease. So the typical presentation is that one has problems with memory, there's rapid forgetting, difficulty in remembering conversations and events, repeating queries, etc. that we're familiar with in typical Alzheimer's disease. But in addition, someone might present with a language problem. Their memory may be fine, but they can't find the right word for something. Pauses occur in language. Repetition is difficult. Primary progressive aphasia is another name for this sort of presentation often called logopenic aphasia. But effectively, it's a language dominant difficulty. In addition, people might present with behavioral change. They may become apathetic and not want to do anything, or may become disinhibited and do things that are completely out of character. 
challengingly in this group, often people have no insight. And so it may well be that this is something that the family find much more difficult than the individual in some cases. Importantly, memory is often also impaired in this group, unlike in some other diseases. And the most common presentation that is not memory within young onset Alzheimer's disease is with visual or spatial difficulties. And just to go into that in a little more detail. So these visual presentations or spatial presentations are also known as posterior cortical atrophy. If you look to the right of the slide here at the brain, you'll see that, that the reason it's called this is because at the back of the brain, the posterior part of the brain, there is more space between the parts of the brain. In other words, there is atrophy in the posterior part of the brain. Terry Pratchett famously described this happening to him when he developed posterior cortical atrophy. And he noticed that when he looked at the keyboard to write um, one of his books, parts of the keyboard started to disappear in front of him, making it difficult to type. Often individuals have made multiple trips to the opticians because they're worried about their eyesight. And often symptoms can be put down to stress or attributed to anxiety and not disease. But actually anxiety is very much a part and parcel of this disease and important to understand. Somebody may have had driving problems and bump into cars or had difficulty judging their spaces when parking. Reading is no longer something that's enjoyed because it's much more difficult. Navigating the local environment, getting through a door, even sitting in a chair may cause problems. And putting clothes on the right way round, which we all think of as automatic, becomes very difficult. In contrast, memory is usually very good and other functions may also be infected. For example, motor coordination. So knowing how one uses a phone correctly, a mobile phone, or rewiring a plug may suddenly become difficult when previously something that was very automatic. Another question that a lot of people are very concerned about quite reasonably with young onset Alzheimer's disease is what's the risk of inheriting Alzheimer's disease? So there are three forms of genetic Alzheimer's disease, otherwise known as autosomal dominant, where one gene causes inheritance of it. This is less than 1% of all Alzheimer's disease, so it is uncommon. But the onset is typically in the 30s to 40s, and therefore it will be slightly more common in the young onset group, but it's still only 5 to 11%. In that group, family history is an important predictor of whether this is a possibility. So it's rare to have a genetic Alzheimer's disease, even in young onset Alzheimer's disease, but the implications are really important. And so what we must do is consider genetic testing in those with symptom onset under 60 and definitely with a family history. And it's vital that families are supported to get access to counseling and assessment where they wish to have it and where it's appropriate. Unfortunately, it is still the case that young onset Alzheimer's disease is poorly recognized for the reasons that I've mentioned in terms of these less typical presentations in part, and it's not adequately supported as yet. So there is a delay in diagnosis, as many of you unfortunately will know. The time from symptom onset is longer to diagnosis. In young onset, it's 4.4 years, whereas in typical late onset, it's 2.9 years, which is still too long. So there are different additional burdens in young onset Alzheimer's disease on the individual and on their family and friends. They may well still have children or be looking after parents and so there are family responsibilities that are different. They may well be in work and that will lead to implications both from the point of view of employment but also from finances. These delays in diagnosis only increase the burden and anxiety that somebody feels when they're not certain what's happening and it delays their appropriate support. Often people have full insight into what's happening. This is going to lead to difficulties with depression and anxiety, as I mentioned at the beginning, more so in fact than in late onset. Once you have a diagnosis, the support is not adequate. There are some fantastic support groups and, and support methodologies out there, but there is not enough and it is still difficult to find care support and respite, which we need to improve on. Treatments at the moment are limited. We know in Alzheimer's disease, we only have symptomatic treatments, but they don't seem to be, 
behaving any differently in young onset Alzheimer's disease. So it is important to use them as we would in any form of Alzheimer's disease. Because of the increase in atypical presentations with non-memory presentations, it's really important that we get speech and language therapy involvement, occupational therapy involvement for visual or motor coordination difficulties, ophthalmological assessment for those that may well need to be registered visually impaired because of these visual difficulties, and psychological intervention for people that are suffering with depression and anxiety or changes in the family dynamics due to these problems. Age appropriate support is vital, not simply expecting it to be fine for somebody to be in with um, 85 year olds in, in a standard care environment. And it's really important that we have access to trials for those with young onset Alzheimer's disease um, where they wish to be involved in something like that as that can help significantly with support. In summary, young onset Alzheimer's disease is not rare. It does have commonalities with late onset Alzheimer's disease, but there are atypical presentations that we really need to think about and ensure that people understand so that diagnosis is speeded up and that the support is properly in place. Depression and anxiety are more common and again need support and genetic causes and appropriate counselling are vital. So one of the things that we need to do as part of the support group is look at how we enhance education and support to speed diagnosis and to improve how we work together with patients and families to make that support better. And as a friend of mine who is involved in trials here says, it's a no-brainer. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Kath. Fantastic overview. Um, I'm full of information. Please, please remember to uh, get your questions in. The panel Q&A will be after the talks, and we really, really hope that you're going to send lots of questions in for us. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Jackie. Thank you. And thanks to Kath for that tremendous uh, input. I think that one of the real strengths of this group and the way these groups work are the fact that there's the interface between people involved in support services, people who are living with dementia, and then that third prong, which is the work with researchers and with clinicians who can bring that kind of insight into what's going on around treatments and uh, the development and evolution of the disease um, and so on. And I think it's a real strength. And so moving on to the next part of this afternoon's session, we're really privileged to go to the heart of the matter, which is to hear from people who are living with Alzheimer's, young onset Alzheimer's now, and to introduce to you John and Pippa Hall, who are talking with Nikki. Good afternoon, and I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. And I'm honoured to have John and Pippa Hall with us today. Good morning. Good afternoon, rather. <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> and uh, can you tell me today, and uh, everybody who's watching today, a little bit about your background, please? My background? Yeah, what did you do as a job? As a job, uh, I wanted to, uh, to uh, have... Um, uh, I'll tell you. No. It's easier for me, yeah. I think. Um, John was, so uh, yes, he was. He he joined the BBC when he was 18 yeah. and stayed there till he was 55. Um, and he sort of worked his way up. So he worked on lots of dramas and things. Eventually, he was um, a sound supervisor, dubbing editor for short format films to advertise things on the BBC. That's what he did. And we met there in 1986. Yeah. Um, and I was a makeup artist. So that's basically how we met. We've been married 32 years. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I don't know. A bit smelly, yeah. I think. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's well, basically how yeah. we met. Brilliant. Lovely. Now, John was still pretty young and in the midst of his career when he got his diagnosis of young onset Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. This must have had a huge impact on you, John. It was for me because uh, someone came in and said, you go in, 
and that was it really and that was the end of it yeah um i think so don't come back it, he worked in quite a pressurized environment and time was of an essence and with somebody at the beginning of dementia he wasn't able to keep up with updates of computers and working under pressure and i think he was struggling and they noticed that they didn't know why he was doing it i think they assumed you were having a bit of a breakdown and um but they were yeah to do it anyway yes possibly but anyhow they just wanted him to have a break and then the next day he got a letter saying oh um we want you to go to a doctor to have a cognitive test which is a bit of a surprise um and so he did that and he didn't do very well and that's when we then went to our gp and mm -hmm. they referred us yeah. to um dr isaacs mm -hmm. at st george's and that's when all the process came. So that was in September 2018. And we got the proper diagnosis in January 9, 2019, after all the tests had come through. Must have been devastating sort of leaving the job that you loved, John. Uh, yeah, so I didn't realise the amount of things that are going to change my part at that point. I just thought I'd be, you know, you thought you were having a two-week break, didn't you? Yeah, and basically I'll be back in work, you know, a few weeks ago to be, you know, I'll be fine. But mm. uh, then it started to come back onto me and then I thought, oh, no, this is for real. And then I started to looking at things and then started to think, well, why can't I do this today? And things, and I, and I sort of knew that things were going wrong with what I'm asking for, for be it either budget and I don't know, uh, just things went and that's it really, mm. lots of little bits of things. Yeah. Which what you could do easily with even just walking with not seeing anything because I could do it all. Yeah, he was very good at his job. Um, he, used yeah. to he used to train and teach people how to do it. Um, so it was a huge shock when he wasn't able to do that anymore. Yeah. I, he had a bit of a change of personality yeah. as well at that time, but I think that was all the pressures yeah. of trying to do his job. So he would be leaving for work earlier and earlier. And I kept saying, why are you leaving so early? Oh, it, it takes a long time for the computer to set up. So he was finding excuses, but using that time to try and plan ahead so that he was able to do his job. Um, I don't think he was really having lunch breaks either. I think he was trying to prepare again for the afternoon. Mm. So when he came home at night, he was exhausted um, and he was very, very short tempered. Um, and he just used to come home and fall asleep. He was just worn out. Um, a few things happened, like he thought that the dog had been left in the groomers and we were out and he thought I was very cruel for leaving the dog in the groomers and now they were shut for the weekend. <laughs> And I was like, dog. but the dog was is at home. <laughs> I thought that's a bit weird, but you know, mm. maybe he didn't understand or something. I don't mm. know. But there were lots of little incidences which yeah. sort of meant that he hadn't got a good grasp on reality. <laughs> yeah. And this this must have had a huge sort of impact is is on you, Pippa, as his wife and your daughter as well. You know, the, when there's a the diagnosis of dementia, it really does affect the whole family and more so with young onset yeah it was tricky for gabby because um when he was sent home from work it was like on her last week at home before she went to uni so we thought well at the time we all thought it was um he just needed a break he was mm. just mentally worn out um and then she went to uni and then we did all the tests and stuff well, no, we talked to Dr. Isaacs first and when mm. Dr. Isaacs, after about a two hour consultation and did some tests with John, he said, I believe John has young onset dementia and it is, I would say, 99 percent sure. So that's when we got Gabby home and we explained to her in person, yeah. which was very hard, very hard indeed. Um, but it kind of explained how John had been very different and quite sometimes he'd be very short tempered with Gabby because he would want things to be a certain way and teenagers being teenagers don't do that she's a terrible awful thing she's a terrible timekeeper 
but because of John's job, he's very much, you know, to the second. So she's always making us late and it would drive him crazy, mm -hmm. things like that. And it, it became more and more that he wanted things to be correct, right all the time. And she was being a bit more, you know, that would be fine, you know, but mm -hmm. he found that difficult, didn't you? Yeah. So, yes, and for, for me, yes, it was really hard. I was trying to hold it all together um, and trying to work as well. So, yeah, it wasn't easy. No, and, and telling, sharing the news with family and friends, that, that's really difficult. And how do you feel sort of the outcome of that has been, especially with friends? Um, I think a lot of John's male friends have found it quite hard to deal with. Uh, that was because all my friends were in what I do. Did yeah. Yeah. So, but they just sort of because the system doing all the TV and all that sort of thing has to be done quick, fast, and fast and fast. So, my friends just and I was in that sort of things. But then, uh, and suddenly they can't stop because they're doing their stuff, and uh, it all just fell about them mm -hmm. really. There's a couple of people that have kept in contact, isn't yeah, there? Yeah. Like Lewis has kept in contact, but it is tricky with COVID. Um, what's quite interesting, a few friends of John's that I've contacted, mm. they've sort of come back into the picture mm. and um, they've been reasonably supportive, haven't yeah, they? they? Come and go. Yeah, they and do come, come and go because they're not even it. living in London, they're living all over the country. Yeah. So, yeah, we do talk to them. Mm. Um, my parents. Have been brilliant. Yeah. Um, my sister's been really helpful. And my friend Jane. What? Yeah, yeah, they have what, been helpful. Oh, yeah. Yes, Your Jane. Mom's... Yes, oh, my yeah. mum. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's right. But a few friends. <laughs> Trouble is, often when you meet John, it's not, you don't always get the full picture. So um, you can sort of, you're good fun, aren't you, really? Okay. And you have a bit of a laugh. Yeah. So they just think, oh, John's just, you know, a genial thing who's forgotten a bit of pieces. But they don't see him at home when he goes to make a coffee and he's standing there and he's about to turn the machine on, but there's no cup under it. They don't, and that's, that's like basic. And that's what's happening recently. So you can't think about, oh, I need something to drink out of. And then when he presses a button and it's all going over the counter, he's going, oh, why is that happening? <laughs> he's like... We need a cup. <laughs> um, just silly things like that. Um, mm. So yes, it's tricky. Mm. Um, I would say John's John's mother unfortunately died about a month or so after the diagnosis. Yeah. Um, and then it's been quite tricky. Um, basically, we don't speak to his side of the family anymore, which is sad. Yeah. But that's that really. Because you, uh, what's it called? It's your sister. Yeah, I know, and the yes, they they kids. They're kids yeah. yeah, yeah. So I know over sort of the time since your diagnosis that one of the things that you know we've struggled with it. We spoke about quite a lot is age appropriate services and activities for John. So yeah. now he's not working. Um, they've been quite scarce. And would you like to share some of your frustrations about this? Yeah, I just don't remember things. That's no, but uh, what it's talking about um, trying to find activities with other people outside the home that you can do. There oh, isn't really anything, is there? No. So I, I do a bit of gardening and I basically do, uh, what's it called? My pet. You're cycling. Cycling and things. Mm. Um, yes, he did. Do, he went to the Bradbury Centre for a while, which yeah. is more aged, um, aimed towards older people. But um, Claire, who was working there at the time, she gave him a chance of working in the garden. Yeah. You quite liked that, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, so he'd right. go there and water the garden and stuff. Yeah. Um, but of course, that's only during the summer. So, and then of course, winter came. <laughs> and then, hey ho, lockdown. So it hasn't been open since. So he hasn't had that. Um, Kingston Carers were trying to find a buddy scheme for John that he could go cycling with, but they didn't manage that. Mm. Um, through John's pension scheme, um, they put him in contact with a guy, and you've been out for a couple of cycle rides with 
him, haven't you? And he lives in Kingston. You don't remember? You you cycled to his house the other day and said hello. Oh, when he came Adrian. in. Adrian. Yeah, yes. I think so, yeah. 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 But again, you know, it's very sporadic. Yeah, very. Yeah. So it is a little bit tricky. I think basically all John really wants to do is go for walks, have a chat, drink coffee and have cake. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't do. sound a bad life. No, it's not a bad life. But, I'm going for a cycle ride. But most of the time it's me on my own. End of story. I would That's like to say <laughs> at this point, considering I haven't worked for three months, he's not mostly on his own. No, I know. And when I do go out to work, I'm trying to sort out someone to come and be with you just at yeah, times of cooking and things. Because yeah. I think you could do with some support there yeah. and a bit of a chat. Yeah. yeah. Now we've got lots of health professionals that's going to be watching this today hopefully mm -hmm. um so you know is there anything that you would like to advise or like to see to be developed for young onset alzheimer's disease people that are affected by this what would be what would be really helpful for you we were talking about this earlier i think you know after the initial diagnosis and when it was confirmed we did feel a little bit alone and thank goodness that we were then passed on to you at the St George's group because otherwise I think we would have just been kind of left and we, did, we didn't really understand what was mm -hmm. going to happen yeah. and we didn't know anybody else who'd had young onset dementia so it's quite young yeah I think That's there's really. sort of like some sort of support that can step in and go it's not as scary as you think it might be. And this no. is these are the things you need to do. Because at the time, you know, he got diagnosed formally. And then, of course, I was trying to deal with his work and trying to make sure he got a reasonable cut off or whatever, sort out how he could be um, lose his job through his illness. And then also trying to sort out the pension as well. Mm. So there was, a, there was a lot going on yeah. with the diagnosis. Mm. And I think some support of what we can expect as well at the yeah, time would yeah. have been very helpful. Yeah. There was another thing I was going to say. Sometimes <laughs> um, I've never ever spoken to anybody on my own about John. And sometimes it's quite hard to say something that might upset him, but I might need to know the answers. And that's another thing I think might be beneficial to people that's all to have some separate time for you yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and it's it's addressing it's not only addressing the patient's needs it's very much addressing what the carer's needs are which well, is yeah just trying to make sure you're doing the best for them really yeah <laughs> there's here comes um, oggy yeah. the trusted dog that Brilliant. He now, follows the dog everywhere. Everybody who has dementia should have a dog. There you because go. Great responsible. Here. Yeah, he's responsible for feeding Oggy and looking after him. Yeah. So that's John's job, isn't mm. it? Mm. John and Pippa will be on our Q&A session later this afternoon. So please, if you've got some questions for John and Pippa, please send them in. We'll be collecting them and filtering them through a little bit later. Thank you, John and Pippa, for your time. Thank you for Thank Oggy you. as well, Turnaga. <laughs> <laughs>
where you thought, yeah, me too, or where you've had a different experience or a different perspective. That's really great um, to, for us to hear about as well. And I'm very happy to give voice to any words that you'd like to share. Um, and also, if you want to share any other experiences or things that haven't been mentioned yet, doesn't necessarily have to take the form of a question. Um, so you will recognise that we have uh, Kath, Jackie, Nikki and John and Pippa back on the screen, um, but also the wonderful Hannah Gardner, um, who is an Admiral nurse in the direct support team, as Nikki mentioned. And we're here yeah, to answer anything that you would like to throw at us. Um, we can't promise to have the golden bullet or perfect answers, but we'll do our best. So uh, let's kick off, if we may, with um, someone who has written in asking about her husband, who has young onset Alzheimer's disease um, in his early 50s, and is talking about um, frequently experiencing falls through collapsing and asking this whether this is common. So naturally, I would want to throw this question over to Kath as the medic on the team, but I thought actually maybe we won't. Maybe we'll just start briefly with Jackie and John and Pippa and just to see, not necessarily about falls, but any motor problems or difficulties with moving or using your body um, um, that you guys have experienced, because I think it's a really under-recognised um, aspect of, of not just young onset Alzheimer's disease, but a number of, a number of dementias. Uh, Jackie, John or Pippa, anything you'd like um, to say? It's, that's a really interesting question. Um, and from my experience, Tony, Tony's mobility didn't fall particularly in the early stages of, of the illness. And I was really interested um, that John's still enjoying getting out on his bike because Tony loved to cycle as well and, and so on. And I think in young onset, um, it's really, really important to make the use, most use you can of those physical skills and to keep active and all the rest of it. And um, that's not just, you know, in the sense of sort of keeping mobile and things, but it can make a massive um, difference to well-being as, as it progresses. And so, as I said, I mean, in terms of the original question, I'm not sure that I can add an awful lot about falls and whether it's, you know, maybe Cass got more to say from the clinical point of view about that. But I think that just sort of generally keeping mobile, keeping active really, really makes a difference. And towards the end of Tony's life, um, I continued, we had um, somebody came in and doing movement with him kind of modified form of shiatsu and so on and so forth, just keeping his muscles. And that made him feel better. He absolutely loved that kind of movement and he did it to music and so on. But for me as his carer, in terms of helping with dressing him and supporting him in that way, it was a really, really valuable thing. I don't know whether Pippa's got any or John's got any ideas, you know, being at a, a different stage of it. But I think that if somebody's having a lot of falls, then there's something going on there that possibly needs looking at, which is because I, I don't think that's actually typical of young onset per se. John and Pippa, anything you'd like to add before we come to Kath? In the mornings, John can be a little bit stiff, can't you? You find it quite hard to get going yeah. in the morning, mm -hmm. but after a while, he's all right. Yeah. Um, we haven't noticed him particularly falling over. Sometimes he doesn't always see things and might trip over or mistake, you know, a hole in the ground and things like that. Um, but no, I haven't noticed him falling and you haven't, have you? No. No. I've got ideas if you've got any money. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not for me. <laughs> for the for people yeah for people yeah. yeah thank you thank you kath would you like to respond to the question about whether falls are common or uh, uh, broadening it out to any, any kind of motor problems or gates maybe so i think um yes absolutely but just before i do i would echo uh the points that jackie has just made actually in terms of it's really important to keep up mobility i would agree with her that in a typical presentation mobility is good potentially um, certainly early on in, in, the, in the disease's progress. Later on, people can develop problems with um, jerky movements, myoclonus, which can cause people to fall over if those movements are violent enough. 
and that's certainly one possibility. In addition, if it collapses rather than falls you're talking about, then it could be that somebody has developed seizures, which are something that's associated later on in the course of Alzheimer's. Um, one of the things that Pippa just mentioned can cause falls. Of course, if you've got visual difficulties, if your perception is not right, then you can miss see, and this is a very common thing, as you know well said in posterior cortical atrophy and visual presentations, people won't see the curbs or edges of stairs or escalators and therefore will often trip and fall as a result of that. Um, you can also have difficulties with your motor function that you were alluding to, Seb, whether it's, um, we call it... She's frozen. Oh, we'll, we'll see if Kath comes back. We'll just give her a moment. <laughs> oh dear. Have I, Sorry, I Kath, you're back now. Sorry. You're back now. You disappeared for a moment. Okay. Where did I get to? <laughs> uh, you just mentioned about falls in PCA, and I think we're just going on to make another another comment. Okay. Um, the, the further comment was around people that have motor coordination difficulties and that you can have a gait where your legs don't do what you want them to do. Um, and it's the motor instruction that then can cause gait instability as a result. Um, it does happen particularly in genetic cases that people can have gait disturbance and falls as a result of change in tone. But I would echo the point, if somebody's having falls and it's early on in the disease, not late, I would want it to be looked at and I'd want them to be examined. Thank you. That's a really, really clear and important point to finish on. Just going to pick up something in the chat that someone has um, talked about installing a ramp to minimise the risk of falling. And so I think that would fall into that, that camp of things we can try and do if perception is causing um, a difficulty or a risk with moving about. Um, but yeah, just want to re-emphasise re Kath's point about if there are lots of things that can emerge um, in with your dementia, which you're asking yourself, is this the dementia? Is this to be expected? Should I sort of not complain about this? Or is this something odd? And I think most people should be encouraged to follow their gut instinct. And if it feels odd, if it feels out of characteristic, there's no harm in asking. The worst that happens is you get told or re reassured that this is part of your condition, but it's never it's never bad to ask, so please do. Um, another question, if we may move on a little bit, um, which is um, talking broadly about the experience of um, cognitive and other symptoms getting worse as you live with young onset disease, young onset Alzheimer's disease, and someone asking about her husband um, who has young onset AD seeming to be declining faster than her father who's in his 80s and asking whether this is the case, does, does YOAD um, proceed faster than other forms of Alzheimer's disease? Maybe, Kath, if we start with you on that one, if that's okay. Can you just repeat that, Seb? I'm sorry, my connection's a bit funny. So I just asked, the broad question is whether young onset AD proceeds or progresses faster than late onset Alzheimer's disease. I think that there's a significant variation in both young onset and uh, in late onset Alzheimer's disease. You can see rapid progression in either um, and you can see slow progression in either, uh, and the range is enormous. I think part of the difficulty with young onset Alzheimer's disease, as both Jackie and I mentioned, is that the, the time to diagnosis is much longer. And so that effectively shortens the length of time after you have diagnosis when you have disease. So I think that's part of the factor. Thank you. I think that's really important. I don't know if anyone else, Hannah, or if any, or Nikki, or anyone else wants to come out. Jackie, I think um, one of the things that contributes to this feeling may be, and I saw it with Tony, and I saw it with a lot of people that we knew through the uh, St George's group, is that you get that kind of progression where somebody plateaus for a few months and then suddenly it's you know it's like the lift dropping or going down in an airplane you know you know in, in a turbulence and that um those sort of steps can be quite alarming that you kind of you're in steady state and you think oh we've cracked this and it's all going smoothly and then suddenly um the person starts having delusions or there's something around ability or there's something around eating or there's some sort of 
um, new idea that gets lodged and, and that can sort of sometimes make it feel as though you're a little bit on a runaway train that you've just got yourself sort of ticking along and you think I've hacked this and <laughs> we're doing all right. And then very suddenly um, you, you find you've got a whole new set of problems there. And I think that one of the things that contributes to that is that is the fact that if somebody is active and pretty vigorous and can move and so on, then sometimes these stages manifest themselves um, more sort of visibly. If, if somebody's um, a lot older and has got mobility problems anyway, um, they might be a bit sort of calmer when things change, whereas you know, if you've got sort of somebody who's physically active, you know, and suddenly decides that it'd be a really good idea to take off all the doors off the cupboards in the kitchen because we're moving tomorrow. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> um, you know, those, those things can sort of hit very, very hard and it makes you think that things, that things are changing very rapidly. So it might be something to do with perception, um, you know, ar around that whole issue. Don't know, but you know, it, it, it's not a smooth decline, you know, you know, like this. I think that's a really good point, Jackie. I think that's a, a huge part of it. And, and related to that perception and the contrast between somebody's wellness and this change is also the difficulty with not feeling supported and that the degree of change in your support as well. I think that also that feeling of abandonment is going to accelerate any feeling that things are getting worse. I think you're absolutely right. And I guess just wider context, just to reassure you that um, the sort of research, broader dementia research community are very interested in this in this question and will continue, I'm sure, to per pursue it. There are, you know, that ranges from people such as some of our colleagues who run the memory services in Essex doing studies looking at, you know, how many M MMSE points, that test that you get asked by your doctors often to do, um, how does that change over time in people who are younger or, or older when they get their Alzheimer's disease, through to some of our colleagues who do the most basic brain science, looking at the, the, the amyloid protein in the brain and saying, is it slightly different? Is it a slightly different strain or species in people have faster versus slower progressing Alzheimer's disease. But as, as Kath come says, all of these sorts of research are done at the group level. And really what all we want to do is think about people as individuals. And, and in that there will always, I think, continue to be huge variability. Um, so thank you very much for those answers, really helpful. Um, another question that's come up um, is about diet and whether an anti-inflammatory diet, the questioner is asking, um, can do any, any, be of any help in resisting Alzheimer's disease, either in not getting it in the first place or in, in slowing it down or lessening the effects once you've got it. Uh, Kath, maybe you'd like to come in on that. This is such a good question. <laughs> and it's a really, really difficult question to answer. So thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so diet and Alzheimer's disease is, is a massive question, which is not answered yet. I'm not going to be able to give you the answer, but I'll give you some things to think about. Uh, it's possible that eating a particular diet might affect the actual mechanisms that cause Alzheimer's disease. So oxidative stress or inflammation, it's possible that diet might change those. Or it might be that diet changes your risk of having heart disease or obesity or diabetes and those things might impact on you developing Alzheimer's. But also there's a lot of interest at the moment as you'll have heard about the gut microbiome and what that does and how important that is in brain function. Um, and this is basically whether you have good bacteria or bad bacteria and the balance of them in your digestive system and how that might change in Alzheimer's disease or in other diseases that's being looked at across the patch actually. Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, all sorts of things. So the question is about diet and, and anti-inflammatory diets. Um, so this is really tough because the diets that are used in a lot of the prevention studies are a so-called Mediterranean diet or a modified Mediterranean diet. And that basically is healthy, lots of veg, lots of fish, not too much red meat, um, and lots of unsaturated fats. 
most healthy diets actually are quite similar to that. So trying to disentangle from that what works and what doesn't work is tough. We know that there's an association of Mediterranean diets or similar with reduced cognitive decline in healthy aging people, but we haven't proved that the diet is the thing that causes that. It might be one of the other factors that I mentioned earlier. And at the moment, there are a lot of major studies, particularly in the States, trying to disentangle the effects of these different diets and, and what they do to your risk of dementia. So there's a study or several studies on Mediterranean diet, several studies on anti-inflammatory diet, which is a close cousin to the, to the Mediterranean diet, and also studies on the ketogenic diet and what that does. And I think several of those studies read out uh, or give results in the next couple of years. So hopefully we will have more information, but lots of research to be done on this. Thank you, Kath. Really, help, really helpful and thorough response. That's great. Um, before our next question, just a couple of comments um, to throw in the mix. Um, Rich, are really about support. Um, a couple of people, one person saying, um, I was diagnosed in 2011, and so far I've had to find my own support network. So our hearts really go out to you because I think um, that we can't begin to put ourselves in your shoes of knowing how difficult it is to walk this journey alone or without the support of other people who know what it's like. And that's exactly what this group um, hopes to stimulate and, and be for some people. And so thank you for being here. Um, and someone else similarly saying they've had major difficulty um, finding support when you have obligations at work, when so many of the services that we talked about and that and Jackie and John and Pippa mentioned aren't available or aren't appropriate or just simply aren't at the right time for you. Um, we completely appreciate. Um, so thank you very much again for being here. Um, the next question I wanted to throw over to um, Jackie, John and Pippa is about the types of support that have been most helpful for you, um, either all, both of you together or all three of you or individually, whether there have been particular types of support that are the sort of the one thing that you'd recommend or high on that list of things you'd want other people to consider based on your own experience. Yeah. I would say support from other people who are going through the same thing because nobody else understands. My friends, all, like you say, oh, my granny's got it and I know what you're going through. And I'm like, no, no you no. don't. <laughs> um, so, yes, I would say it's talking to everybody else and then you can chat and work things through and just having some good people around, good friends, some good friends that can help you as well when you've got problems I've decided now I can't leave John on his own um, especially for cooking so we've arranged for someone to come he, he I came home I had to work on Tuesday I came home he'd put the chain on the door so I couldn't get in <laughs> um, luckily enough our dog's not very tall so he didn't bite my hand off as I was trying to get it off um, and then I walked in, I thought, oh, it smells a bit cookie. Three dinners, and I would say the pizza we could have used as a roofing tile because <laughs> it's so annihilated. John told me he'd had a lovely evening. He'd eaten half, um, uh, <laughs> what's it called? What's your favourite thing? I've got, um, it's catching. Um, oh, anyway, I'd had half a bottle of red wine, some beer, a block of chocolate and um, oh, a che half a cheesecake. I was confused. He was very happy. <laughs> John, I'm just thinking of all the people out there uh, who would like to do the experiment. The cat just talking about experiments about how your diet affects your. <laughs> what a lot of people would volunteer for the test of that diet. That's I can eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Jackie, what would you like to recommend? Or well, what I'd like to recommend is, is what we've just got from Pippa and John, which is keep your sense of humour about you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the, find people that you can have a laugh with, really, <laughs> because there, there are laughs to be had and you might as well have them. You know, I mean, obviously, it's a sad, it's a sad situation and one that you wouldn't choose, but... Um, Certainly, you know, look at, looking back over our time as a family with it, um, I was very interested in what um, Pip and Pip and John were saying in their film about friends, 
and the fact that you very soon find out who are the friends who are going to be supportive and who the family members are. There are some people who just don't get it. And there are some people who find it really, really awkward. And they'll say, oh, you know, I just don't know how to talk to John anymore, you know, so therefore I'm not going to come near you. And that, that, that happened with Tony, you know, but there were one or two people who surprisingly just turned up out of the blue. You know, there, there was one guy, in fact, who was a, a work colleague of mine, and he said, um, I've always had this idea about making a, a bicycle out of copper piping. Would Tony like to help? <laughs> and, um, you know, it was just this lovely sculpture of, 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 a, of a bike made out of copper piping. And, and so he had Tony to go around to his house for two or three days, you know, and they worked together on this, you know, that kind of support is informal support, just of somebody who had a bit of creative thinking. And um, so, so that, that was brilliant. The other, the other thing that I learned um, was that in the early stages, we went to a couple of places like day centers and even sort of care homes. And, there was this sort of sense of shock and isolation at the sense that um, the, the other people there tended to be sort of 85 year olds or whatever and so there was this huge age gap and there was one point when Tony said to me you know is this all you think of me is this all I'm fit for mm -hmm. but we came to realize that those places are staffed by young people mm -hmm. and you know sort of young people very often from different ethnicities and so on and so forth and some of those young people became very good friends of Tony um, in surprising kinds of ways and so it was really you know what one bit of our learning was don't just always look at the obvious and that sometimes within a setting that you might have written off and sort of said well this isn't appropriate there are things going on which actually um, made a big difference and so I think that that was quite helpful but I think the big thing is is that with young onset people in the same boat as Pippa said and um, in the early days of the St George's group there were 14 of us 14 couples who'd all been diagnosed around the same time and we used to go out and have meals together and you know if it was the kind of meals where people ended up eating off the wrong plate or drinking from the wrong glass or you know doing weird things then so be it you know because we're all together and it didn't matter and we had fun and we went for walks and we went to the theater and things and you know so I, th I think if it's possible that kind of networking can really really make a difference you know and it, and it, con and it continues now you know i mean I'm, I'm still friends with those people now even though we're all at different stages Thank you guys, that's really helpful. So sort of support, humour and friendship, those sound like... Yeah, that's a nice summary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hannah, I know, at, well, you and Nikki, the rest of the direct support team, but I know, Hannah, that family is a, a very much part of your work um, as an Admiral nurse as well. Um, so maybe you'd like to follow on in commenting on, on that topic about what support you think is most helpful for families. And also I was going to throw you, if I may, a, a specific question, which one of... Yeah present has asked which was about uh, a very practical everyday thing which maybe you and Nikki would like to comment on about how you get someone with young onset Alzheimer's disease to have a shower and eat dinner when they think they've already done it and maybe any any of you might want to come in on that topic but maybe Hannah you might start. Yeah oh yeah some they're good questions and family um, with Admiral Nurse role it's all about supporting families as we know dementia doesn't just affect the person it ripples through the whole family and it changes dynamics and emotions and roles of that person within that family too and the whole family so having that community around you your friends and support that understand dementia and including the person still in activities and enjoying holidays when we can and going out for meals and embedding that support as well which is really vital and animal nursing is about supporting families and helping with interventions that that, that person and family might need that, for that specific person because we're all individuals no one is the same with Young onset dementia, we all have different families, different backgrounds, religions, and it's really important to give that care to that particular person as a whole um, and that support for that people. For some people, we act different to a different diagnosis too. So, so yes, Admiral Nursing is about supporting the families. So pleased to join RDS and be able to support those families. 
to. And the next question really about how to get someone to have a shower or eat when they think they've eaten already. Um, I think the best thing is to stay calm because um, sometimes you, your anxiety can be picked up on uh, that person as well. Um, it might just not be the right time of day. So maybe just delaying a little bit and reapproaching the situation or shower um, into the, if you're not gonna have a shower in the morning, just delaying it to why not have a shower in the evening and not putting too much pressure on yourself. Um, and then it's about engaging it. And I suppose it's really important to stay calm and things like the showers, having sort of um, pamper parties, massages, washing your hands first and seeing how they are approached to that as well. Um, but yeah, and if someone doesn't want to shower that day, does it really matter the next day? It's, it's, if it's gonna cause too much distress. Um, and eating as well, the same sort of techniques and, um, and yeah, just not putting too much pressure um, and then maybe just changing a different option or even just trying finger foods instead of a whole meal, uh, snacks um, instead of a whole um, meal and sit down, maybe have in chat with a person as well while they're eating and have snacks in place to sort of distract them um, might help. And also keeping that food chart if you are worried about that's what intake as well. So you've got a record of each date you can sort of view review on and keep in mind. Thank you, Hannah. Anybody else would like to comment on that or add to that comment? I'd like to sort of talk about sort of seeing these as not so much chores, but activities mm. and sort of getting some music on. And, you know, quite often people can be quite scared of showers, being stuck in a small cubicle and, you know, this water pouring down and not knowing what to do. And actually it's quite difficult to, to shower somebody if you're not in with them. But if they've got Alzheimer's disease and, you know, they struggle to know how to wash or remember to put the shower cream on and things like that is really difficult within a shower so it might be the fact of going into using baths instead and having lovely bubble baths and having toys in the baths and actually just having some fun while doing it and sort of the same sort of is with the with food and uh, you know the chores of feeding and should you know is it time to eat have we eaten shouldn't we eat again moving moving that into an activity and getting people involved into making food together um, i had a lovely scenario recently where a, a lady was struggling with this with her husband and so you know i suggested they made food together and he really wanted to post me the photos of the beautiful cake that he'd spent hours decorating and um it, it was just magical you know he was asking you know when can we do this again so it, it is sort of looking at the way you're approaching it and you know activity is, is often quite a good way of doing this so re really the two question previous questions were sort of linked in the sense of fi finding the fun not just yeah. out and out going to comedy gigs or having telling jokes but actually finding the fun in the everyday was really important. thank you that's really helpful um, I'm terribly mindful of time. Uh, many people have made other, other comments and questions, which we will try and respond to um, in the sort of follow up email that we send around. For, so, for example, someone asking about um, handy gadgets that are out there for helping keep track of people if so to enable them to keep free and independent as much as possible. So those are some of the things that we will try and um, link and send you further information and signpost you to. Um, uh, after the event. And a few people have asked about uh, slides, so we'll try and make uh, slides from today available. The recording of the meeting will also be available afterwards. Um, and you can get in touch with any, any of the team via the contact at um, address, and we're always, always here for you. So without much further ado, I'm going to say thank you very much to our wonderful panellists, and I'm going to hand back to Kath, Nikki and Jackie um, just to close the meeting for us. Thank you. Thank you, Seb. That was an absolutely fantastic discussion. That was so rich and there were so many positives in there. And the fact that fun and joking and keeping the humor in things has come out so strongly makes me very happy, actually. <laughs> so a really great discussion. And just the beginning of things, I think it shows how much we need to continue this talk amongst us, between us, and, and grow this group so that we can start to do some of the things that Jackie outlined in her Magnificent Seven uh, in her talk, which was beautiful and really did outline what we need to be thinking about and we need to be doing.
So thank you everyone for joining us. I am going to ask Jackie and Nikki if they want to say any final words before we finish. Just how exciting it's been to, to actually, you know, have this come true at last. It's been something that's been talked about for a long time. And, um, you know, I, I think that what's happened this afternoon shows that there is a need for this group. Um, but there's an extraordinary sort of rich seam of, of topics and ideas and things that we can carry forward. And so really looking forward to continuing to be a part of this going on and, um, you know, looking forward to the positive outcomes from it. So thanks for all the support, you know, at base for making this happen because it's, I know a lot's gone into that. So thank you to Alicia and the team. Thank you, Jackie. And I just want to say, what a lovely way to finish the week. What a fantastic Friday <laughs> afternoon. We've thoroughly enjoyed ourselves and I hope you have out there. I think it's been brilliant. Um, I want to thank the fantastic team that's behind this, Claire and Livy, um, as well as Little Isia. You know, without those people, this can't run like this. We have had some extra questions in which we promise you we will answer and we'll get the uh, questions and answers back to you next week with the recordings, with the slides, and we're gonna start putting some resources together which people will find find useful uh, and that will just grow and grow over time so um, as we said you know please contact us you know with with your questions sort of between between times also sort of about support but also if you've got su some suggestions if things really work for you please let us know about it so we can share the good words thank you nikki and with that i'm going to say goodbye and thank you all for joining us at the beginning of what i think is going to be a really exciting journey and um, we hope you can come with us thanks very much thank you bye bye, bye. Yeah, see you soon you. hello my name is eva tate and i'm the major appeals manager and manager of the rare dementia support fund held by the charity the national brain appeal the National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Supports 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for Rare Dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new Capital Appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the senior fundraising officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. 
We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you're interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas, such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, posting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.